Amen. Number one in your hymnal, number one, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let's all stand together as we sing, My Savior's Love. On that verse together, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. A sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden. He prayed not my will, but the blood for mine. Oh, how oh, wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. On that last, when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Good singing this morning, and uh, good to see everybody here. Welcome to I Love My Family Sunday, and uh, it's been I Love My Church Month here at Bible Baptist Church, and uh, today, uh, especially focusing on I Love My Family, I'm, I'm thankful that you're here to be a part of the service this morning on a beautiful, beautiful day, and uh, glad you made your way to church this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now today. We thank you for another Lord's Day that you brought us to. Thank you, Father, for what we just sang, that how much and how great your love is to us. And Lord, we're asking you to meet with us here this morning, that you'll be, you will be able to minister and to speak to each of our hearts. Lord, we want your will to be done in our midst here today, and we pray that those in this room who've never come to understand just how much you love them, that you so love them that you gave your only begotten Son, that they would come to that realization today and receive Christ as their Savior. Father, may your will be done here in our midst today. May you be pleased with the service. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Strong and true 
great. 285, if you'd turn with me. 285, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. You can remain seated as we sing 285. On that first together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. few announcements for us now listen carefully if you would um, right after the service this morning uh, Lindy McKeon will be over in the fellowship hall if you'd like to get a family portrait taken uh, you can go over there and she'll get your picture taken um, there will be a clipboard there and you need to sign there with your email address not going to hand you a hard copy of your pictures we're going to email it to you and then you can print your own picture, okay? Uh, so your name and uh, the email address that she can send you your picture, all right? And uh, does a great job. There's a couple different backdrops there, and uh, so head on over there after the service, and uh, you can do that today or tonight, okay? Whatever's best for your schedule, and uh, we look forward to that. Tonight, 530 is our Christian growth class, and uh, we meet in the conference room right across from our nursery. And tonight we're going to have a lesson on root problems, root problems. A lot of times all we deal with is the fruit of the problem, and we're not getting down to the root, and so we, we kind of get the fruit done, and then pretty soon it grows back again because we never got down to the root of the matter. And so we'll talk about some root problems tonight during our Christian growth class. And then tonight at 6.30, we'll be back here for the evening service right here in the auditorium. And uh, Lord willing, tonight I'm going to speak to you on the subject, Train Up a Child. <laughs> The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The best child-rearing book in the world is the Bible. And uh, the reason we've got such a difficulty rearing children these days is because we've gotten away from the Bible. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at some principles tonight from the Bible that will help you. And uh, by the way, so, oh, I don't have any children. No, but you're around children. And uh, you know people who have children, and uh, you can be a help uh, to them and an encouragement to them and there'll be some just some life principles that'll be a help to you uh, this evening if you're in the service so uh, we look forward to a great time together this evening then uh, this coming Saturday men will have our men's breakfast that's at 8 15 in the fellowship hall and uh, you feel free to sign up for that there's a paper on the table right down at the bottom of the steps and uh, go ahead and sign up best meal in town for three bucks I'm telling you uh, you get eggs and you get bacon and you get potatoes and you get uh, biscuits and gravy and uh, it's a great great time great fellowship and always a, a lesson from the word of God and it's a, it's a great time together this Saturday at 8 15 and then next Sunday uh, will be our special offering for the higher ground offering it's uh, it's listed in the bulletin there uh, what that offering is going to go towards to, to help us with some renovation that we need to do and uh, so we appreciate you praying and planning to give 
uh, for next Sunday. Then two weeks from today, we change our clocks. Isn't that exciting? Uh, hold down your enthusiasm, okay? Uh, and uh, we get to lose an hour, but uh, we'll, the, the day is going to be longer, and the sunshine is getting longer, and uh, it's, uh, we're ready for spring and summer. Amen. So uh, that's coming up, and uh, we're, lo- we're looking forward to that. All right. Now, I want to take just a moment, and we want to welcome our guests we have with us in the service today. We're always pleased when folks visit with us. And if you're visiting this morning and you're not a regular member or attender here at Bible Baptist Church, we'd love to meet you, find out who you are and where you're from. And so if you're visiting with us this morning or if you brought a guest with you today, would you honor us by standing for a moment and we could find out who you are and where you're from? Ricky has some guests right down here. Great. Fantastic. It's great to have you folks. Ann and Sean. Great, great. Good to have you all this morning. Lavelle, good to have you today. Great. All right. And Denise? No, no. That's great. God bless you, Denise. Thanks for making the trip over. That's great. It's good to see you. Okay. Right back here. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Great. Great. Good to have you this morning. Wow. Fantastic. I'm glad you did. John? Good, good. Great to have you, John. Thank you. All right. Brenda? Great. Wonderful. Good to have you girls with us today. Thank you. All right. Good to have you back. That's great. Girls, thank you for coming. Wonderful. All right. Anyone else? Seth Lloyd, you got a visitor? <laughs> Come on, put put hair in your chest. Stand up and talk. There you go. <laughs> okay. right. Joey, all right, Joey, good to have you this morning. God bless you guys. Good, good job. See, it wasn't so bad, was it? All right. Didn't take long. All right. The ushers handed you a visitor's card, and if uh, you'll be kind enough to fill that welcome card out, we sure would appreciate that. And a little bit when we have the offering, just put the card in the plate if you would, and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. We're glad you're here. Let's give all our guests a warm welcome, shall we?
411 in your hymnal, 411. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah, the message unto you. I'll give 411. Look and live. Let's sing that first together. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah, a message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. I've a message full of love. Hallelujah, a message unto you, my few. Tis a message from above, hallelujah. Jesus said it, and I know tis true. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. On that last together, I will tell you how I came. Hallelujah to Jesus when he made me whole. Towards believing on his name. Hallelujah. I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Well, it's I Love My Church Month, and uh, we get another testimony today. And uh, today we're going to hear from Bob and Tanya Reed. And um, the first fellow we met when we came to Bible Baptist Church, I think, was uh, Bob Reed. Uh, we came down to candidate, and as the church would, we would speak that night, and then the church would discuss it. Bob had just come back to the church, and he wasn't uh, a member here again, and so he took us out to the fellowship hall, and we talked to Bob while they talked about us in here, and um, did that for uh, several services, and um, then uh, Bob went away uh, to El Paso for a, well, you got married, didn't you? You got married. That Tanya took you away. That was the issue, wasn't it? And, uh, well, and uh, they... Uh, Left, I went. It was, uh, I think, was it February of 07, '07 that uh, they left and they served out there for a, for a summer. Then they came back to us and really been here serving since uh, 2008, haven't you? And um, just I tell you what, he is uh, what a difference Bob Reed makes. You have no idea. You have no idea. Uh, we couldn't, the church would not be where it's at today if it weren't for Bob Reed. Uh, he not only with the, the music ability and the leading of the choir and the handling of the music issues, but so many other things that he does. Uh, he does a great job with Reformers Unanimous. He handles the bulletin. He handles the prayer sheet. He handles so many things in the office that uh, get taken care of behind the scenes. Uh, he, he takes care of all those things. And uh, just a tremendous guy. There's not, there's, uh, there's not many that can be a good second man and enjoy it but Bob Reed enjoys that and uh, he could be a leader and he is a leader and he could he could lead the the thing but he always uh, wants to know what the pastor wants what the pastor would like what I would like it to be and I come up with ideas sometimes and he, he asks me for details and of course I don't have any and uh, I say that's that's what you got to figure out, all right? <laughs> and uh, and he does, he does, and uh, does all does it does a great job. I I, I can't uh, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate Brother Reed and, and his wife Tanya. Um, Tanya is they they have a couples class during 9:30 Sunday school hour, and uh, Tanya works with the little ones on Wednesday night. The four and five year olds and maybe six year olds and uh, the, the wee ones uh, Wednesday night club she's active in the RU program as well remember now this is a couple with four children that every Friday night are at RU every Friday night and uh, just just amazing 
and uh, great, great to see their family grow. Uh, Lord willing, going to see uh, two of the boys baptized this evening, and uh, that's exciting, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So we love the Reeds. They've just been amazing. God send our church, and uh, we're going to hear from them this morning why they love their church. Let's sing our song together, and then we'll watch the video, all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I was saved when I was five years old in Awana Club. I was memorizing scripture and wanted to know more about what the verse meant. So my parents led me to the Lord at a very young age. And at the church, I work in the nursery. I do a Wednesday night club and I sing in the choir. So not a whole lot of stuff, but I really love my church. And I love my church because of all the people, the wonderful people in it, and how they love each other and but most of all love the Lord. And I love Pastor, I love Kathy, and there's so many things that I could say about how I love my church and why I love my church, but most of all, I love my church because we follow our Savior, Jesus Christ. I was saved on uh, Wednesday, June 15th, 1994, um, after God took me to the end of myself. Um, I've gone through a, a, a long period of um, proclaiming the name of Christ, but not uh, having Him as my personal Lord and Savior. Um, uh, many years later, I came here to a Bible Baptist Church in uh, about October of 2005. It was just a week before Pastor and Kathy came to candidate um, at the church, and I had a wonderful opportunity to get to know them uh, very well uh, before even um, I became a member of Bible Baptist Church. Um, we have enjoyed the fellowship with them ever since. Um, uh, Tanya and I were married in June of 2006 and, and uh, brought her up to uh, Grove City, to Columbus, to uh, join me here at Bible Baptist Church, and we've been uh, serving here. Um, since that time, we had a uh, little time away in uh, 2007, 2008, where we went down to uh, Bering Precious Seat in El Paso and worked with the ministry down there. Then the Lord brought us back up here in uh, September 2008. Um, I began uh, working with the music ministry somewhere in 2009-ish and um, began serving in the RU program in um, the spring of, uh, I believe, 2013. Um, now that we have all that uh, taken care of, I'd just uh, like to take a moment and say why I love my church. I, and um, there's uh, four reasons that I've uh, come up with that I love my church. And uh, number one is because this is a different church. And um, I, I think there's no other church quite like uh, this church. This is a, uh, there's a real sweet spirit in this church. Um, there's a, just a, a, the loving nature that's in this church. It makes it for a very different uh, church. It's not the norm for sure. And then uh, secondly, because we have a dedicated congregation. Uh, the dedicated con congregation that uh, is, it, it's different because the vast majority of members actually do something. They serve uh, in some capacity or another here at Bible Baptist Church, whether it's ushering or nursery or choir or, um, you know, maintenance or working in the office or whatever it is, um, it's a dedicated congregation. And then uh, uh, third we have a dynamic cleric, and uh, our pastor is just wonderful. He, uh, he's, he's not simply a man that fills the pulpit, um, but he, is, uh, he studies diligently um, uh, for the messages. He prays daily for uh, the members of the church and our missionaries. Uh, he, he's a giver uh, of abundance. He encourages uh, the people. He watches for opportunities within the um, community. He has a burden uh, for the world. 
So he's a uh, dynamic cleric. And then uh, finally, um, this church has a dynamic calling. And uh, because of pastor's leadership, there's a, a determination in the outreach um, of Bible Baptist Church, uh, whether it be the dinner days or the country fair, or, um, are you or are you inside or um, the daily encouragement or the words to encourage um, the nursing home ministry, the bus ministry, whatever it is, the uh, de the uh, determined um, calling that uh, God's given this church is just uh, fantastic. And uh, so for those reasons, I love Bible Baptist Church. And for clarification, when Tanya says don't do much, that's really an uh, understatement of the year. The fact that she allows me to do what I do is uh, tremendous, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, let's turn over to 538 together, 538, and uh, let's all stand. On that first together, all praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for men to die, that he might men redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Children, make your own way out and out to Junior Church as we sing that third together. Redeemer, Savior, friend of men, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. 
Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the Mighty Prince of Peace. Let's sing that last together as we find our seats on that last. His name shall be the Counselor, the Mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. One more time on that chorus without the piano. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Be seated, if you will. Ushers will come. We'll get our offering now this morning. Give us the Lord as blessed and prospered you. All right. Good uh, report this morning. Brother Danny Wright got to preach down at the CRC prison for their morning service this morning. Had uh, well over 100 men in the auditorium there and um, somewhere around 50 of those men, almost half of them accepted Christ their Savior this morning. So it was uh, just an incredible response. And uh, so God, God blessed that in a real way. And uh, we rejoice in that, brother. Right? That's a great open door there. And uh, God's doing good things. We're excited about that. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much for the privilege that's ours to give. And Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. And it's such an honor and a, and a privilege to be involved in the work of God and what you're doing in this world. And Lord, I pray you'll bless the giving today, the giver and the gift alike. And Lord, may these gifts be used for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ so we can continue to reach into the prisons and reach into the community and reach around the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless this offering, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 39, if you would please, Isaiah 39. We are going to read the first four verses of Isaiah 39. I'll, I'll read verse 1, you join me on verse 2, I'll read verse 3, and we'll end together on verse number 4 of Isaiah 
chapter 39 and verse 4 will be our text verse for this morning. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house they have seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts and continue to make us ready to receive the truth from your word today. We want to thank you for the Bible. We thank you for preserving your words for us. And Father, I pray that by thy spirit, you'd speak to each one of us today. Lord, may you help us to focus upon you and uh, put out of our mind things that would capture our thoughts and our attention. And help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this morning. Blessed is special to that end. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bethlehem Calvary, all of that time. Savior is mine, mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. What a Savior is mine unto the uttermost wonderful glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine there on the cross where he died for my sin. Oh, what a Savior is mine, giving his life a poor wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine, rising again in his infinite grace. Oh, what a Savior is mine, shedding upon me the light of his face. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. A savior is mine unto the uttermost wonderful glorious. Oh, what a savior is mine. Lift 
Touching my burnt hands, relieving my care. Oh, what a savior is mine, giving me courage to do and to dare. Oh, what a savior. Savior is mine unto the uttermost wonderful glorious oh what a Savior is mine would you sing that chorus with me again oh what a Savior Oh, what a Savior, oh, what a Savior is mine unto the uttermost wonderful glorious, oh, what a Savior. Doesn't get any better than that. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for being our God and for Christ being our Savior. And I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word today and we look at this particular text of what have they seen in thy house as we focus on our homes today, a Christian home. I pray, Lord, that Christ would still be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto him. I do pray that any in this room that do not know what a wonderful Savior he is, that they'd come to know him as their Savior this morning. Thank you for the good music today. Thank you for the good spirit this morning. And now, Lord, I pray that your will be done in each and every life. Pray your will would be done and that the Spirit of God would go up and down these rows and in and out of every, every aisle and in every row. Stop at every occupied seat. Please minister to the people today as only you can do. Help me as I bring this message and help the folks as they listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the best kings in Judah was a man named Hezekiah. And what you're reading at here in chapter 39 this morning was he was sick. And in fact, he was going to die. There was no hope. All right. Uh, but Hezekiah turned himself to his wall and he, he prayed and he cried out to God. He, he, and the Lord, by the way, heard his prayer. And, and he said, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. He said, I'm going to give you... 15 more years to live. And God miraculously gave him, extended his life for 15 years. That's the good news. The bad news was Hezekiah didn't use those 15 years like he should have. During the time when he had been sick, Hezekiah was visited by an envoy from Babylon. And Isaiah the prophet had seen this group come in and go out. And so he comes to Hezekiah in the passage we read. In Isaiah, verse number 3 there of chapter 39, Isaiah said unto king Hezekiah, What said these men? Whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They're come from a far country, even unto Babylon. And then, Hezekiah, and then Isaiah asked him the question, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house they've seen. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And of course, Isaiah gives him the news that what they've seen, they're going to come back and get. And certainly that was prophetical. 
and Babylon did come back and invade Israel. And it didn't happen in Hezekiah's day, but it did happen later on in his son's day. Israel, you know, Israel had a great many leaders to look to, but they don't, there, there wasn't a lot of great homes to look to, at least that were recorded for us in Scripture. You know, Eli was faithful in his house, but his sons were wicked. Samuel was a faithful prophet of God, but his sons did not follow in his footsteps. That's why Israel said, we want a king like the other nations. Because Samuel, you're getting old and you're going you're gonna to die and your sons don't follow you. So they wanted a king. David was a great king. David was a man after God's own heart. But David had two sons that had, one committed rape and another committed murder. David had difficulty in his family as a father. Hezekiah would be no different, though the Lord, by His mercy, gave him 15 more years. There was a son born to Hezekiah during those 15 years. And that boy's name was Manasseh. Manasseh. His name means forgetfulness. And he lived up to his name. He forgot everything his father had stood for. A great revival had come in Judah underneath Hezekiah's leadership. But when Manasseh took over, he brought back the high places that Hezekiah had destroyed. In other words, he brought Judah idolatry back into Judah. Manasseh raised up altars for Baal. He made a wooden image. He really, uh, he, he kind of took for his example, not his dad, Hezekiah, but, but, but Ahab who was one of the most wicked kings that Israel had ever known. Manasseh brought and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and, and served them. He got into astrology and, and worship of the stars and the, the moon and the sun. He built altars in the house of the Lord to false gods. The Bible says he made his son to pass through the fire. That was the god of Molech. And he was worshipped by, he had arms outstretched and, and, and it was on an angle where they would roll down and, and his big belly was just an open fiery furnace. And your worship of this God was to sacrifice your son into his arms. And people would do that. And Hezekiah did that with his son. Or, or, or Manasseh did it with his son. Would have been Hezekiah's grandson. He even set a carved image of Asherah in the house of the Lord, which was a Canaanite goddess of fertility. Listen, he went completely against what his dad had done and how his dad had lived. Let me help you understand something, Mom and Dad. It is not your occupation that's going to keep your children living for God. It isn't your position in the business world that's going to cause your children to turn out for God. It is not the, 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 your, your social standing or your financial standing that's going to turn your children out for God. It is not the size of your home or the location of your home that's going to turn your children out for God. What's going to turn your children out for God? What's going to cause me to have my children to, to, to live as I, I want them to live and live to please God? i tell you what it's going to be. What have they seen in thy house? What have they seen in thy house? I believe there are certain things people ought to see in the home of a believer. In the home of a Christian. If the Bible makes anything clear, listen, the Bible says there to be, there's to be a clear distinction between someone who is saved, as the Bible speaks of. That means someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and someone who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they've never put their faith in Him. The Bible calls there's only two types of people in the world. The ones who have trusted Christ are called saved people. The ones who have not trusted Christ as their Savior are called lost people. That's Bible terminology. Saved or lost. That's the only two kinds of people there are in the world. It's the only two kinds of people there are in this room this morning. 
You're either saved or you're lost. And, and God says there is a distinct difference between how a saved person lives and how a lost person lives. He says it is, it is as different as, as light and darkness. It's as, it's as different as worshiping God or worshiping idols. It's just a clear distinction. And I think there ought to be a clear distinction in our homes and the way we live. Listen. You're not the Christian you are when we see you at church and you're all dressed up. You're the Christian you are when you're at home inside the four walls of your house. That's the Christian you are. If your Christianity is not any good at home, it's not any good. All right? So what have they seen in your house? And I'd submit to you, first of all, what they ought to see in our house, in that place that we call home, they ought to see salvation in our homes. They ought to see salvation in our homes. Is there evidence of the Lord's salvation where you live? Now, look in your Bible with me. Uh, leave the book of Isaiah, if you would, and go to your left. Let's go back to the book of Joshua. Back to the book of Joshua. Joshua, and if you would, get chapter 2. Right after the book of Deuteronomy, you'll find the book of Joshua. If you went to Judges, you went too far, come back. Joshua chapter 2. What's happening here is uh, two men have gone to spy out the city of Jericho. And the people of Jericho have heard about these two guys and they're coming to look for them. And they duck into a woman's house called Rahab. And Rahab hides these two spies and does not give them up to the authorities. Okay? And she, she tells them in verse 16, of chapter 2, to get into the mountain lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, verse 17, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, that thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of the house, of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever will be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear." And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Here's, here she is. They, they, what they're saying is, we're going to come back. Jericho's going to be destroyed. And she, she got them to make a, a, a deal with her, a promise, that they won't destroy her house. And they won't destroy anybody who she gets in the house. And the way to mark her house was a scarlet cord that they let down the window. That's how she let the guys down. They, she lived on the wall. The walls of Jericho were, were very thick. That People built houses on them. Okay? And so she lived on one of those houses on top of the wall. And they let those spies down. And she said, Did you leave that scarlet cord there and, and that'll be our marker and we'll know that we don't touch that house. And so they agreed that, that would be the proposition. I want you now... You remember the story of jo the, the Jericho, don't you? You know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. That's the real. Eat your heart out, Bob. Um, the, uh, they marched around the walls, remember, one time a day for six days, then seven times on the seventh day. And when they uh, shouted with a great shout and the priests blew the trumpets, the walls came down flat. And they went in and took the city. However... What about Rahab? By the way, here's Rahab making the promise that anybody who get them the promise, anybody you get in your house is going to be saved. They're going to be spared. They're not going to, they're not going to be killed. And so she's got to get these people to believe that God's the true God. He's judging our city, and you have to get into this house. Now, when I say the name Rahab, what usually follows that name? Rahab the harlot. How do you think her family and her loved ones, and I'm talking about mom, dad, brothers, sisters, people closest to her, 
How do you think they're going to respond to her coming and telling them to believe in, believe in God of Israel? You think they knew what she'd been? I'll guarantee you they know what she'd been. Oftentimes when you've lived a life of sin or you've lived a life of addiction, the hardest people to convince that you, you, you're different and you really believe something now is those who've been closest to you. And that's what, that was Rahab's deal. But look what happened. Look in chapter 6 of Joshua. Joshua 6. Notice verse number 20. Let's start there. So the people shouted with the, when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out, hold it, Rahab, her father, and her mother, and her brethren, and all that she had, and they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And the Lord saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Hey, she didn't just get mom and dad in. She got mom and dad and brothers and other kinfolk uh, that, that she was able to get rescued. Why? That speaks of salvation in her house. Salvation in her house. She had that scarlet cord that came down through the window. I think about when the death angel came through Egypt, when the, the last of the plagues, the death of the firstborn, and God said that you're going to have to take a lamb without blemish, without spot, and you're going to have to kill that lamb of the first year, and you take the blood of that lamb and apply it to the two side posts and to the doorposts of your house. And when the death angel comes through that night, he's looking for the blood on the doorpost. And if you've applied the blood, he'll pass over your house. He won't kill your firstborn son. If there's no blood there, then the firstborn son will die, and he'll, he'll take, you, you'll lose him. And, and as a great cry went through Egypt that night as many lost their firstborn child, their firstborn son in that plague. But when they saw the blood, he passed over them. Hey, do people see the blood of Jesus Christ at your house? Does your house speak of salvation? Does your house tell, just by somebody being in your home, can they tell that that home belongs to Jesus Christ? Hey, if they looked at the books on your shelf, could they tell that that home belongs to Jesus Christ? If they looked at the DVDs and the DVD collection, could they tell that this home belongs to Jesus Christ? If they looked at the CDs that play in the CD player, or if they looked at the songs on the iPod, would they be able to tell that this home belongs to a Christian? This home belongs to someone who believes in Jesus Christ? Do the, do the television programs that come across the TV say that this home belongs to Jesus Christ? Do the movies you stream into your home, do that? They, 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 they easily tell. People could look and see what, what movies you've streamed for the last month and say, oh, these folks love Jesus Christ. Awful quiet in here. Hmm? What have they seen in thy house? Do they see salvation in your home? The song says, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Hey, I, I want to sing it. I want to shout it wherever I go. I want all to hear it. I want all to know the joy of salvation that makes my heart glow for I've been born again. Listen, let your house speak of salvation. Then I think your house ought to speak of prayer. Over in Acts chapter 10, you read about a man named Cornelius. 
And when you read about Cornelius, you find out he was praying and he was praying in his house. When God sent the angel to say, your prayer has been heard. And he was praying. By the way, he was praying that someone would come and show him how to be saved. Someone would show him how he could know he had eternal life. Then I think about Acts chapter 12. Acts 12 is an interesting story because Peter and James have been thrown in jail. They have already beheaded James and Peter's scheduled for the beheading the next day. And as he's waiting that night in prison, he's sleeping. And God dispatches an angel to come get Peter out of prison. The Bible says Peter was sleeping between two soldiers and the angel had to almost kick him to wake him up. I mean, that's sleeping pretty sound. He didn't seem too worried about getting his head cut off the next morning, did he? And finally he wakes him up and, and he kind of thinks he's still dreaming. And so he, he, he leads him through the first gate, second gate, out until he gets out into the streets of the city and then the angel disappears. And so Peter's looking around thinking, well, how about this? Here it is, middle of the night, everybody's asleep and I'm out here all by myself. Now what, what, what is going on? And he's trying to figure out what, what he should do and you know what he thinks about? Somebody must be praying. And when he thought that somebody must be praying and he thought, where would they pray? He said, I think I'll go to John Mark's mother's house. Wouldn't that be great? Hey, if somebody thought, hey, there's a prayer meeting going on, would they think that your house might be the place where they're having it? Or would they think, no chance. Prayer. huh? Would your house be a candidate for a place where they'd say, oh yeah, if they're having a prayer meeting, boy, could be that place right there. Your house ought to be a house of prayer. Uh, a place where there's prayers that go, go up to the Lord. John Mark's mother's house. And of course, you remember the story. They were praying. They were praying for Peter to get out of prison. And Peter knocks on the door. The little girl ran to the gate, remember? She looks, sees it's Peter, and she goes, Ah! It's Peter! They went, and she ran back and told the others. And they said, Oh, it's his ghost. Boy, they're praying faith believing, aren't they? Finally, they have to come and look at it themselves. And sure enough, God answered their prayer. Peter's out of prison. John Mark's mother's house. Is your home a place of prayer? Do you pray at meals? Do you pray, do you pray at bedtime? When needs arise, do you pray? When, when difficulties come up, you say, well, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what. Why they do that? Man, they, they shouldn't. Do you just talk about it and complain about it? Or do you say, hey, it's not opportunity for us to pray. Let's ask God to work in this situation. Hmm? The children learn that they get things accomplished by, by figuring and manipulating and conniving, or do they figure out when we have hard times, we pray. We pray. We, we look to God. Make your house a place where prayer is seen. Where prayer is seen. Salvation is seen. Prayer is seen. The Bible is to be seen. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant goes to the house of Abinadab. The Ark was in his home for a while. And the Bible says God blessed his home because the Ark of the Covenant was there. Now, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments the two slabs of stone that Moses had. And so the Word of God was inside that house. Now I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Would you look there please? You're in Joshua still maybe. Just go to your left into Deuteronomy and look up down to chapter 6. Are you doing okay? What have they seen in thy house? They've seen salvation. They've seen prayer. They ought to see the Bible in your house. Deuteronomy 6, notice what the Lord commands Israel here. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto who, church? Thy children. And listen, 
you're going to talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Do you have Scripture in your house? Do you have Scripture? Do you have things? You say, yeah, you, you, we don't write it on the wall, I hope, but you can hang a picture there with the Scripture on it. You can, you can make it obvious that uh, this home years ago, somebody made one, we got one of them plaques or someone made it for us, burned it in wood. Uh, the words of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Uh, put that right up by your front door so anybody who comes to look at it, they know who this house belongs to. They know what you intend to do. They, they, they understand your intentions. Do you? Is the Bible out at your house? Is the Bible read at your house? Do you have time when you gather the family together and read the Bible? You ought to have a set time when you gather the family together and read the Bible. But listen to me. Don't fall into the trap of of having a set time and read the Bible and then nobody thinks or talks or says anything about the Bible the rest of the day. Don't fall into that trap. How many of you are old enough to remember when the phones we had had a cord on it? <laughs> and when, you, when you go, you'd only go so far because you were tied to that cord. And so you could go and buy the, extend, the longer cord, couldn't you? So you could walk 15, 20 feet away. And so you'd be wanting to do it, ladies. I remember so often, you know, you want to do something in the kitchen. And uh, my wife or my, my mother, I remember they would, they would cradle that phone in their ear. You know, some of you used to do that. And you'd keep working. And you'd keep talking. And if you went this way, you had to remember to turn around and go this way. Because you'd get wrapped up in the cord. And you know, listen. Hey, that's what prayer and Bible reading is. Have a time when you, you, you get together and you read the Bible and you pray and you sing a song and you, you teach your children. But I want to tell you something. Don't hang, the fi- don't hang the phone up. Don't close the Bible up and say, okay, nothing on that till tomorrow. No, the Bible says you're supposed to be talking about it when you're rising up, when you're sitting down, when you're getting up, when you're going down, when you're walking by the way, when you're going about your business. There's always opportunities to teach the truths of the Bible with everyday situations of life. That's when you teach the principles. Don't just think that, okay, wait, we had, listen, I had a devotion every morning. I took them to church three times a week. And they turned out for the devil. Of course, you know, we had HBO in our home. That's home, that that, that stands for home body odor. Okay? It stinks. It'll make your house stink. Okay? I mean, what have they seen in thy house? Don't compartmentalize it. Do you have do you have obvious things in your home where people say that? The Word of God's in this house. G. Campbell Morgan, who's a famous preacher of another generation, was invited to his son's home. And he came and he looked through it and then he gave a gentle rebuke to his son. He said, your home is beautiful. It's it's, uh, well arranged, well furnished, and beautifully decorated. He said, but there's nothing in this home to tell me that it's a Christian home. There's nothing in your home that tells me that this home belongs to Jesus Christ. Is there anything in your home to tell people that it belongs to Jesus Christ? Does your home speak of the Bible? Hey, do your children ever see you read the Bible? They see you taking time with God's Word? Our homes speak of salvation. Our homes speak of prayer. Our homes speak of the Bible. Let me say, number four, our homes ought to speak of obedience. Obedience. Matthew chapter 26. Would you look there with me for just a moment? Matthew chapter 26. First book of the New Testament. Matthew 26, notice verse 17. Would you look there, please? Now the first day of the feast, now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, 
the master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Jesus is going to have his last meal with his disciples. He did it in the upper room of somebody's house. They used their house as a tool. They use their house in service for God. Why did God give you your house? Just so you have a nice place to live? You think God intended for you just to have it for yourself? Boy, it's quiet, isn't it? Do I have a pen? I could drop it right now. Huh? Or do you think God gave you that house to use it for Him? Use it for His service? What about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? They loved to have Jesus in their house. And He went to their house. He gladly accepted the invitation. The Shunammite woman of the Old Testament added on to her house. Build a room just for the prophet of God. Put a bed and a table where he could study and rest. And anytime he's traveling, he didn't have to stay at a motel. He could stay at her house and in this special room that she and her husband added on to their house. You use your home to host a missionary family? Use your home to have couples or families over for fellowship? Use your home to have a Bible study with a neighbor? Use your home to have a servant of God, an evangelist, or a pastor, or a missionary over for a meal? Noah, Noah got his entire family in the ark. When listen, the whole world was lost. But Noah got his sons and their wives and got them in eight souls and got them in the ark. He saw them serving God. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is your home a place of obedience? If your home is a place of obedience and it's a home where the husband is the head of the home and all that means is the husband sets the direction for the home. The head of your head sets the direction of where you're going. If you don't want to follow the direction of your head, try looking one way and walking the other. You're going to run into trouble. You have to have some. Your head is there for a reason. It sets the direction. It's going to be a place where husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. It's going to be a place where wives will willingly submit to their husband. And by the way, we. The scripture says right before that, it says that, that we're, we can submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. This idea that, hey, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say a man, a husband, is to look at his wife and say, you're supposed to submit to me, woman. Hmm? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that's your job. So what does it command you to do? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And the, the response you're going to get is she will submit to your authority. She will follow your leadership. But you've got to give her something to follow. Yes. Sitting around the house in your underclothing and belching out loud with a clicker, TV clicker in your hand isn't giving her anything to have leadership. Yes. She doesn't have much to respect or follow. You're welcome. We'll talk about this this evening, but it's a place where children are trained in the Scripture, where parents discipline their children. Children who children where children obey their parents instead of the other way around. Our society seems to have it backwards where parents obey the children. Our parents bargain with the children. Oh, come on, please, Susie, please, be good, be good, please. I'll give you candy. I'll give you candy if you be good, please. I, I won't, I, I can't get ahead of me here. I'll, that'll be later. <laughs> children who see their, children who will see their parents praying or studying, being faithful to the Word of God. Hey, uh, children who see the family serve God. 
There's nothing wrong with the family serving God. Hey, bring the whole family when you come out soul winning and you come out visiting. They all can knock on doors. They all can pass out flyers. They all can invite folks to church. How hard is it? Now, it wasn't a child who brought John a, a track at McDonald's. How hard is it to throw someone sitting at McDonald's and say, here, I'd like you to come to church? Not, not everybody's going to bite your head off. John didn't. Right? Huh? He just accepted it, and guess what? God touched his heart, and he said, I guess I'll go check this out. All right? And so, serve the Lord together. Bring the whole family on the bus route. Let the whole family serve. Let them know that, that, listen, children don't lose interest in church. Parents lose interest in church. And the children follow. As long as you stay excited about serving God, as long as you stay excited about being obedient to God, as long as you stay excited about serving the Lord, they will too. They will too. Serve the Lord with gladness. Are you happy in the service of the king? Come on, get up. Got to go to church. You know, if we're not there, pastor's going to call us. Okay. Right? Come on, let's go. Hurry up. Huh? And, you're, and all the way here, you're... And then as soon as you open the car door and you step into the church, hello. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, it's wonderful to be here. And you know what? Your kids are looking at you like... They're wondering, what happened to you? What have they seen in thy house? Did they see that joyful obedience to the Lord, serving the Lord, that you're happy in the service of the King? I think they ought to see salvation in in a Christian home. I think they ought to see prayer in the Christian home. I ought to see the Bible in the Christian home. I think they ought to see obedience and service to God in the Christian home. I think they ought to see forgiveness in the Christian home. Forgiveness in the Christian home. Let's talk about the prodigal son from Luke 15. He didn't leave on real good terms. Give me. Give me what's mine. Now, let me ask you a question. Was he ready to handle his inheritance? That was pretty obvious. Now we know the rest of the story, don't we? No, it wasn't. It wasn't the Bible doesn't say how much time lapsed, but it doesn't appear to be a long time, and he's out of money. He wasn't ready to handle it. And I'm sure Dad told him that. How do you know Dad told him that? Because that's what I'd have said. I said, you're not ready to handle that kind of money yet. Yeah, I am. I don't know what I'm doing. Hmm? You're not wasted at all. And then when he needed money, guess what? Nobody would give anything to him. And so he gets a job working at a pig farm. And for a Jewish boy, that's the bottom of the rung of the ladder. In fact, I don't even think that's on the ladder. And he's slopping the pigs, and pretty soon the husk and the slop the pigs are eating looks pretty good to him because he's starving hungry. And then he comes to himself. Look at Luke 15. You got, it? You got a minute? You're not going anywhere, are you? Luke 15. We're going to be done here soon. The Reeds had such a long testimony at what time got later today than usual. <laughs> It can't be the sermon. Luke 15. Verse 17. Verse 17. The, the prodigal says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father's house? No. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against thee, against heaven and before thee. I'm no worthy to be called thy son. Make me. That's quite a bit difference than give me, isn't it? Make me as one of thy hired servants. He arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Father ain't listening. 
He said, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. He said, I'm going back to my father. Listen, he, he knew there was forgiveness at home. He knew there's forgiveness at home. And he got out the fact he sinned. And, and, and that, by the way, if you're away from God today, it always seems like it's a long way home. It always seems like God's so far away. What you don't understand is He'll run to meet you. The Father ran to meet Him. He didn't have to go down that long road all by Himself. Uh, the Father came running to meet Him and welcomed Him and forgave Him. There has to be forgiveness in the home. What, what was here? Weeping. What was here? Hugging. What was here? Kissing. Tenderness, forgiveness, all of those are present in a Christian home. All of those things are present in a Christian home. The Christian home is not the place for grudges. The Christian home is not the place for criticisms, for gossip. It's a place of love and a place of forgiveness. What do they see in your house? Mom and Dad, be careful. I'll tell you what I, what I don't, what I, what I know from this story, what the father never said to the prodigal. You know what he never said? Don't you ever think about coming back here again. He never said that or he'd never come home. Be careful what you say. Okay? Be careful what you say. And be careful, be careful about giving advice to people about how they ought to handle a situation. I've, had, I've heard people say, well, if my husband or my wife, they were ever unfaithful to me, buddy, I'd kill them. You better be careful what you say. And by the way, I've had some people who've heard, made statements like that or that they would divorce immediately. They'd never forgive them for that. And guess what? They didn't have to go through it, but they had to go through it with their children. And now they had to eat the crow that they spoke earlier. You know what? He came back. He knew he was sorrowful. He knew he wanted forgiveness. And Dad said, bring the robe. Put it on him. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. And he, he listen, forgiveness means you forgive and you, 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 you justify. You treat them just as if they had not done it. Justification. God says your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You make the conscious decision you will not hold it against them anymore. That's forgiveness. That's a conscience choice. Because we're to be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Spoke to a fellow Thursday night at the prison. Said he recently had gotten saved. He was asking me what baptism was all about. And how do I get baptized? And he said he's getting out, I think it's the end of this year, December. And I said, well, if you don't have a way to be baptized in here, he said, when you get out in December, you come to Bible Baptist Church and I'll baptize you. He said, you baptize someone who's been an ex-convict? said, doesn't matter to me where you've been. It's a matter of what direction you're headed. See? God takes care of that. Be obedient to Him. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. What have they seen in thy house? Salvation. Prayer. The Bible. Obedience to the Lord. Serving Him. Happily. And forgiveness. Love, tenderness, kind-heartedness. You can't, listen, you can't put it off till tomorrow. You start living it today. <coughs> I took a piece of plastic clay and gently fashioned it one day. 
And as my fingers pressed it still, it moved and yielded to my will. I came again when days were past. The bit of clay was hard at last. (coughs) But the form I gave it, it still bore. And I could change that form no more. I took a piece of living clay and gently formed it day by day and molded with my power and art a young child's soft and yielding heart. I came again when days were gone, and it was a man I looked upon. But he still that early impression wore, and I could change it nevermore. You only have one opportunity to mold and shape the home and the lives that live in that home that God has given to you. Don't miss that opportunity. What have they seen in thy house? Heavenly Father, take the truth now this morning. I pray, Lord, you'd give us homes that would honor you and glorify you. Homes that would be obviously and distinctively Christian homes that would speak well of the Savior. And Father, I pray You've spoken to hearts this morning. And if there are people in this room who need salvation brought to their home by faith in Jesus Christ, I pray they would trust Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. But I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, I know for sure that if I die today, I'd go to heaven. There's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed to be saved and I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And Pastor, I know, there's no doubt in my mind, I'm 100% sure if I died, I would go to heaven. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Just slip it up. All right, you may put it down. You here this morning would say, Pastor, I, I don't know. I didn't know anybody could know. You're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Would you let me pray for you? No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to call you out. I'll simply remember you in prayer that the Lord will continue to work in your heart. Would you say today, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, Pastor, but I will appreciate you praying for me about that. I am concerned about it. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, pray for me, Pastor? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. I see it over here. Thank you. Amen. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Pastor, I want the kind of home that you spoke about this morning. I don't know what the Lord touched your heart about as we talked about what ought to be seen in your home. But the Spirit of God touched your heart about something. And you'd say, Preacher, there'll be some changes made in our home because I want everybody to know that our home belongs to the Lord. That as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Pastor, God spoke to my heart today. Will you slip your hand up, Christian, say pray for me? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and then we're going to have our invitation. During the invitation, these who are already believers, they're already saved, they're going to come and pray and ask God to help them to have the right kind of a Christian home. If you're here today and you slipped your hand up and said, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. We'll have people here at the front, they'll have a Bible, and they've been trained to to show you how you can know for sure that when you die, you'll go to heaven. We'll take you aside privately and just show you that from the Bible. So you have opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior. Would you let someone take a Bible and show you that this morning? When the others come to pray, just slip from your seat, come right down here to the front, I'll meet you, and we'll have someone take a Bible, and they'll, they'll show you from the Bible how you can be certain that when you die, you'll go to heaven. It's the best news you'll ever hear in your life. Just respond to the Lord this morning, will you? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless this invitation today. Lord, I thank you for speaking to the hearts of people this morning. Lord, I pray for your will to be done now in these next few moments. 
I pray for these who have put their faith in Christ as their Savior and you've touched their heart about having a Christian home. Let their home, their house speak of Jesus Christ. I pray they'd come and bow the knee and you would hear their prayer today. I pray for these who lifted their hand and said they're not certain about whether they'd go to heaven. That they'd come today and let someone take a Bible and show them how they can be 100% sure that they're on their way to heaven. Father, may your will be done in every heart and life today. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Have you respond to him this way, morning, will you? Lord, That's right. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Go ahead and be seated if you would. Okay. Name of a young lady here. We have a man being dealt with this morning as well for salvation. So praise the Lord for that. And we're glad to have, let's see, do you say that, Tevin? Good. Tevin Carter. Of course, Ricky's little girl. Uh, Tevin got saved here back in November. And uh, she's now coming today and wants to follow the Lord in baptism. <laughs> And uh, Tevin, congratulations to you. That's great. You all can go down with Miss Wallace, and uh, she'll take you downstairs and get you set. And we'll get ready to baptize Tevin Carter this morning. That's great. All right, Brother Bob? Well, I've seen a few favorites this morning as they're getting ready for baptism. Anybody have a song we haven't sung for a while? It's your just absolute favorite. You say, I wish someday they'd sing my song. Quentin? 
All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power. That would be 531, 531. Five, three, one. Let's sing that first together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Seventy-six, one seven six. In times like these, on that first together, in times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Four oh seven. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. There have been names that I have loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine. As a name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Good. Charles? 198. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. 198. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? Devin Carter. And Devin, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death, 
Raise them like this and give them like And the servant said, Master, it has done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Brother Pete, 488. 488. A new name and glory. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for hell. Savior? 81. 81. When morning gilds the skies. 81. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries. May Jesus Christ be pleased. I How many, that's a new song for you this morning? Yeah, sounded like it. All right, very good. So that's a good one, though. Leanne? 193. Jesus and me. On that first together, I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. My burdens were with my day I looked for a friend not knowing that he had all of the time been looking for me now it is Jesus and me for each tomorrow for every heartache and every great John got this on John is that Staten John Staten and John you received Christ as your Savior this morning yeah. praise the Lord God bless you man. <laughs> praise God that's wonderful we're happy for you brother God's great wonderful and uh, well I'm glad I came to church today amen good day in the house of the Lord Appreciate you being here, and uh, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer, and look forward to being back for some more tonight. Amen. All right. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for decisions that were made for thee today. Thank you, Lord, for John receiving Christ as a Savior. Thank you for Tevin obeying you in baptism uh, today. For other decisions made here at the altar that will make a difference in our homes, that I pray will make a difference in the lives of people. We can influence others for the kingdom of God. We love you, Lord. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. Give us a good afternoon. And Lord, I pray that you'll bring us back for the services this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 Um, let's sing the joy of the Lord is my strength, all right? Let's do that. Brother Bob. The joy of the Lord is...
is my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Be sure to get your picture taken over in the fellowship hall. You are dismissed.